I have put together a presentation that um, is divided into two parts. First, uh, an uh, introduction to biomarkers uh, and how we actually deal with biomarkers. I'll give you our kind of menu for biomarker development. And then uh, there will be a, an example that I will tell you about where we have followed our uh, menu. I'm an MD, I'm a medical oncologist by training, and then I went to United States, got an additional education in molecular biology, came back, got position part-time clinic, part-time uh, research, and now full-time research, leading a group of scientists working uh, with predictive biomarker, mainly in cancer. And uh, this is what we're gonna talk about, but I try to do, uh, make it more general because I know that you are not cancer researchers, you are mainly in the, the area of diabetes. So I think at least the first part will be for everybody. <coughs> uh, so we'll go through these uh, different points here and um, you can just look at them. So we'll start with the medical problem. And I think this is very important. How many of you are MDs? <coughs> that actually answer my <laughs> <laughs> question. It's very important. The worst that can happen is that you work for five years, six years, seven years. It takes a long time to develop the excellent biomarker. And when you come back and present it to your clinical colleagues, they say, sorry, but we left that drug two years ago. So be sure that you check continuously that you have a, a good medical question. And it's also more easy to develop the biomarkers if you know the direction of your, your aims. Um, I think this is what is important, what do you expect to find? Put up a hypothesis and uh, I think the, the, the best invention we have done, and we, done it, we did it recently, is actually where we could not confirm our hypothesis. So we had to go back and uh, find out what is it? What are we looking at? What could it mean? And then we found some publications that we didn't know of, we should have known of, that actually explained what we found. So if everything always comes out as you expect, there's no need to do research. So put up a hypothesis and prove it or disprove it. It's, it's a good starting point. Um, then selection of methods, DNA, RNA, protein, hypothesis or data-driven, model systems, and this is very important. When we do cancer research, we know that for any cancer patient, at least in Scandinavia, but most places in the world, there's a paraffin block. So if we develop something that requires frozen tissue, we start with a failure because we'll not be able to implement it in the clinic ever because there isn't uh, frozen tissue from all patients. And, and it's a rare event that you actually get frozen tissue from many cancer diseases. So we always uh, know that it, it should either be used on paraffin sections or blood. That's what you can get, or urine or whatever you're looking for. But don't try to develop something that you will never be able to implement because you can't get the material that is needed. For us, this is important. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, we, we, we try to do it hypothesis-driven, but sometimes it's going to be data-driven as well. Model systems, just to everybody knows that uh, it's totally impossible to extrapolate from a mouse or another system to the human uh, situation, but you can raise new hypotheses that you can test in a clinical setting. Very important, very, very, very important. Um, be sure of when you come to a stage where you want to test your, your biomarkers, um, perhaps in clinical material that was collected years ago, uh, years go and so on, that you get the best quality of material that you can ever get. And you can account for how it was sampled, how it was processed, how it was stored, and so on. Otherwise, we, we did a huge study in microRNA, and uh, we analyzed, I think, 1,000 uh, blood samples, and uh, the main result was that we could see from which hospital the sample came from. Uh, and, and that's actually uh, a disaster. Come in, please. So, so be aware of that 
as I say in the United States, garbage in, garbage out. You will never be able to validate your, your ex perhaps excellent biomarker if the material you are using is not well controlled. Assay validation, same account for the assay validation. If you don't have a totally reliable assay, then the data you generate are of no value. So validation, validation, validation of your assay. Those assays that we have developed, we have a continuous validation, quality control of everything to make sure that it performs as it should. Otherwise, we'll never be able to reach the clinic. Um, pilot study, very important to figure out in the material you have in hand, which questions can be answered and especially which cannot. I think as scientists, we tend to overinterpret what we can do with material and we want to know everything. But very often, the way the material was sampled and if it comes from clinical trials and so on, perhaps you can only answer a few questions and you have to be aware of that. And again, uh, high quality samples uh, are needed. When I was a, a younger scientist, the way we did biomarker studies, validation studies, was that we opened the lid of a freezer took our hand in and grab as many samples as we could and we analyzed them and tried to see if we could correlate them to something. And I mean, this is totally stupid and uh, nonsense. Uh, and, and you have to be aware of that, that this is very, very important that you know what you're doing. Also, I hope you saw that my slide on the pre-analytical variables and the essays came before the pilot study. So don't try to do a pilot study with a non-validated assay because then you run the risk that you get false results. Uh, then uh, in, in, in our world, in cancer biomarkers, uh, there are international guidelines and we can reach what is called level of evidence one for its clinical use and that means you can actually start applying FDA and EMEA for, for, for your uh, marker by either uh, performing prospective studies or performing two retros uh, retrospective studies but in prospectively collected material from pros prospectively uh, conducted clinical trials. So in some way it's more easy than, um, than uh, developing a new drug because as you will see a little bit later we can go and find old studies, former studies that were well conducted, well powered where there's high quality of material and we can then test our material and it is considered as good if you have two of them independent studies as a um, prospectively run study. But there are many uh, discussions about how you put these uh, studies together and it's an art by itself. Um, we want to have a predefined statistical plan Otherwise, it's, it's like a fishing expedition. You start to see if you can find a correlation somewhere and so on. So we, we have now a predefined uh, statistical plan with a main objective and then some exploratory analysis that you can apply afterwards. And if you do the exploratory analysis, this is only again for uh, raising new hypotheses that needs to be tested in the new set of samples. Um, that's okay. Uh, and then how do you get the, to the last point? You need to present your data wherever you can present them, uh, write reviews, good publications, um, perhaps do phase four studies. And I, I think I risk um, now to say that from my perspective, it will never ever be possible for any of you or myself to implement something in the clinic a biomarker, for example, without a company in between. None of us can fulfill the criteria or criteria needed <coughs> for clinical implementation by ourselves. We need to have a company in there who can do the last part of the work. Okay, um, the, last, the last comment on this is, uh, and many people have said, a bad biomarker is as bad as a bad drug. You can make as much damage with a bad biomarker as you can with a bad drug. So be careful. Okay, uh, I want to present a case. How long time have we used? Um, Too long. Ten minutes. <laughs> Carl, 
Scott, thank you for coming. Goodbye. <laughs> I, I have the time. No. Okay, you have yeah. the time. Okay, so so we're doing fine here. So I'll try to follow the rules that I presented to you before. And here, this is a cancer case. So unfortunately, um, cancer in the large bowel and the rectum is a very frequent cancer type uh, in the Western world, and a lot of patients are dying from the disease. When the patients um, get a recurrence, a relapse of the disease, we have two different types of treatment. 5-fluorouracil plus oxaliplatin, it's a combination, the backbone of this 5-fluorouracil, or it can be combined with another drug, evinotecan. The interesting thing here is that they work equally well. They are equally efficient as first-line treatment. So some places in Denmark, they start with this one as first-line treatment, and some places they start here. But based on the literature, it um, appears that it's not the same patients responding. So the medical problem is, when you see the next patient in your clinic, should you start with this drug, or should you start with this drug? And I think this is uh, something you can um, consider for, for many drugs. Uh, I have a good colleague working in rheumatoid arthritis. We just talked about it on our way over here. And they start, they have different, six different biological treatments, TNF-alpha inhibitors. And they start with the one, and if it doesn't work, they go to the next one. And they're really in need of finding out which of these six ones should we start with. Instead of going through it, uh, all these different drugs, it's expensive, uh, and the patients are not uh, cured or, or relieved uh, in the beginning. So our question was, how do we, can we develop a method to distinguish between these two? There's also a very good ethical concept in this because it's, it's highly ethical because it doesn't matter if you came to one cancer center, you will get the one treatment, and one cancer center, another one, you will get the other treatment. So it's totally ethical to do the testing here. And the last point I want to say about it is that we don't need to take the, the case here, but you can uh, think about it yourself. How much better, how, how higher likelihood should there be in order for you to choose this one than this one? I mean, if I said it was 50% higher chance of responding to this one, this one, nobody ironed out. But if I said 10% or 5%, you can consider if you would still say this, I would. So this is what we were up against. The hypothesis is that it's possible to identify predictive biomarkers that can be used to guide the oncologist in selecting the right treatment to the right patient, and in this case, Fox versus Folferi. And this is just a little cartoon on, on what we are working on. So what we are aiming at is a predictive biomarker. And this should be separated from a prognostic biomarker. A prognostic biomarker is defined as a marker that can tell you which, uh, that can tell you something about the natural course of the disease. So in this case, we have 16 patients, and our biomarker told us that these four patients with a, with a non-green color, they are in risk of recurrence of their disease. So they are in need of additional treatment in addition to the surgery. So we can, with our prognostic biomarker, identify these four patients, and then we take them over here. But now the question is, we have a treatment A and a treatment B. With who should get which? And here we need the predictive biomarkers that will tell us that these three patients have a higher likelihood of responding or have benefit from treatment B than treatment A, while this one is vice versa. So this is a difference, and it can be a, a Many markers have both features, and it can be very difficult to, uh, to distinguish between them, but this is another discussion, uh, how you do that. Uh, anyway, we decided to do cell line studies, clinical sample material, and literature studies. This was very important, because apparently there's a lot of publications on biomarkers that you see two, three, five publications, and then they die out. But it's not necessary that they are poor biomarkers, but it can be that the studies were poorly conducted. So they, they killed their own biomarker, even though they, they did their best by doing the wrong um, validation of it. So we went through, and um, I'll just show you a little bit here. This is our cell line studies, and this is, again, to generate hypotheses. So we made resistant uh, cell lines, I'll come back to that, and out of 10 colorectal cancer cell lines, we looked for for clinical material, we did um, characterization, and we did uh, by DNA, RNA, and protein. I'll come back to this. A lot of bioinformatics, 
Uh, our literature studies, we selected candidate genes, we have done functional analysis by modulating the gene expression of, of these genes that we uh, uh, um, identified, and then we went over and did clinical validation studies. How long time does it take? Can you do it within one year, or are we talking about five years, or are we talking about ten years? Probably more ten years than one year. <coughs> This is just our cell lines. We can take it fast. We selected these cell lines either against irinotecan, this is the active metabolite, or oxalic platin. Had these resistant cell lines, sequenced them, and did a lot of stuff to find uh, new genes that we could uh, test further on. Uh, this is um, what we have done with the cell lines, uh, many of these things. We have a cancer center between Denmark and China uh, in Copenhagen. I'm the uh, center director, and uh, this is being done uh, between us and the uh, Beijing Genomics Institute in Shenzhen, just uh, close to Hong Kong. So we are doing uh, DNA uh, sequencing, we are doing RNA sequencing, and gene expression data, and we are doing um, methylation um, epigenom epigenomic uh, analysis. And then we have added a lot of uh, prodromic analysis in order to find potential biomarkers that we can further validate. But this is only, as I said, we can raise hypotheses based on this. Uh, but we have got a lot, of, a lot of very, very interesting data out of this. Um, I'll say that it's a huge, huge amount of data that we get from, from uh, China. And fortunately, we have um, uh, at the Danish Technology Technical University that is just north of Copenhagen, a very, very strong bioinformatics and systems biology group headed by Søren Brunak, uh, and they are part of our center. So they take care of the um, data analysis together with our Chinese colleagues. But this is, for me, as I can see, the, the major bottleneck is that we get so much data and it, it takes really, really, really good and experienced bioinformaticists to get something um, meaningful out of it. Also, that many of the things we get from, especially the DNA uh, sequencing, ends up by, by creating data-based, and not hypothesis-based, but data-based uh, further experiments, because we see all these mutations, and we don't know what they actually mean. And uh, mm -hmm. we can say this is uh, present in more than uh, a certain percentage of the cells, uh, or of the uh, patients or in the cell lines and so on. But really, to link it up to functionality is a huge task also. So I really like to get all these data, but it's also difficult to interpret. We have, of course, we compare the uh, DNA aberrations with the expression profiling and can actually find some very nice things. We have some genes that are extremely highly upregulated when cancer cells become resistant. And what is nice is that some of these comes out as being heavily amplified. Uh, so it's based on an amplification of the particular gene. So that kind of makes sense. But this is more, I think, the exception than the rule uh, that you can find such good correlations. Um, so it's, it's a good tool to have, but um, it's also troublesome sometimes. OK. Um, so this was, as I said before, we um, using forming fixed paraffin embedded tissue. So we have developed a lot of uh, different tools, including uh, together with DACO, the Danish company, fish probes for some of the, the genes that we have interest in. And um, we have, together with DACO, made sure that um, the assays are performing well. So this is exactly what I mentioned before. And over and over and over again, make sure that the readout is what you expect. Um, we had these 10 human colorectal cancer cell lines and found out that the top one gene that is a target for evinotecan, one of the two drugs that you combine with 5-fluorouracil, uh, was amplified in some of the cell lines. And we thought perhaps this is a biomarker for um, this particular type of chemotherapy. How long time has gone? I have no idea. <laughs> OK, yeah, yeah, good. And, and this is in, because here, this is interesting. Everybody knows that 
this drug, irinotecan, is a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor. So when we started looking at this, there were people saying, if it's so simple, people have done it. I mean, come on. If it's so simple that this is a predictive biomarker for that drug, people would have done it. So it can be. This is not the case. For some reason, people had not done it. Uh, and uh, you'll see what came out of it. Um, this is just a cell line study. I just want to show you that we have, if you just take the top one copy number determined by fish analysis in the cell lines and the sensitivity of the cells or resistance, you can see there's a correlation. So the more uh, uh, copy number, the higher copy number, the more sensitive the cell lines are to this drug, which fits the hypothesis. Just, I don't know, to go to the other one. Just a fish analysis uh, from one of our studies, and this was done together with with Kirsten uh, and her group at DACO. And it's easy, this is paraffin sections, it's easy to count. Here's a diploid cell with two green dots. That's the centromere probe, a reference probe on centromere 20, where the top one gene is located. And the red dots are the top one gene. And these diploid cells, there's only two of each. While if you go to a cancer here that is amplified, you can see there are much more um, uh, red dots than green dots. So there's a amplification or gain of the top one gene. It's easy, it takes time, but it's easy to, to quantitate. Um, we did pilot clinical studies, uh, and this is also important. When you have a biomarker you think is interesting, you need to find out if it's present at all in clinical material. So you first do a frequent, frequency study. You, want, you need to know, is this present in, in, in a number, in a percentage of patients that makes it clinically relevant. If it's only 1% that present this biomarker, if it's 10% or above, it becomes clinically relevant. Of course, also based on the clinical question, but it needs to be present in a certain at a certain frequency in order to be of interest. And we could see here that um, in, in, a, in a cohort of uh, samples from uh, colorectal cancer patients, that more than two extra copies, that means four copies or more, we had in a little bit more than 30% of the patients, so that makes it at least clinically relevant in relationship to frequency. We also did a pilot study with a very little cohort of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer that received the drug, and then it was measured afterwards if the tumor continued to grow or whether it decreased in size. And um, what came out was, it, it was borderline significant, but what came out was that if you have a colorectal cancer, for every extra copy of the top one gene, more than two, you get, have a 62% increased chance of responding to ibunotecan. So this suggests that there is a relationship, but it's not the right study, but it's a pilot study. Um, then uh, we were encouraged by these data, so uh, uh, I identified a pan-European study called the PTAC-3 study. It's a study on, on, colorectal can uh, on colon cancer patients, stage 3. That means they have lymph node involvement, but no distant metastasis. And this study, they tested the hypothesis that addition of irinotecan, this topoismerase 1 inhibitor, to the backbone of 5-fluorouracil would be better than 5-fluorouracil by, uh, it, uh, by uh, its own. Uh, but it showed no benefit from adding irinotecan. And there was another study, um, an uh, US-based study, showing the same. And this changed uh, practice in oncology, so um, it's not being used in advent treatment. And now, Ralph say I should speed up, which I will. Predefined statistical plan, exploratory analysis, endpoints defined. Uh, just look here, this is the expression. So fortunately, they had expression data on this cohort. So before we, were f uh, we had finished our FISH analysis, we could look at the expression of the gene. And here is a po uh, patients with low top one, no difference whether they got irinotecan or just 5-FU, while if you have high top one, they have a benefit from getting irinotecan in relationship to recurrent-free survival, and the same holds true for overall survival. So this was, again, an indication that we were on the right way. And um, I can jump these ones, it doesn't matter. Um, we have done all the FISH analysis now. We have sent all the data to, to the 
uh, PTAC tweet uh, data center, and we are awaiting the final analysis. But already now, we have an agreement with an American group who performed a totally similar study. Uh, and the same results came out. And they are, if we get positive data out of the European study, they provide all the TMAs, tissue microarrays, for, the, um, for their study. So we can validate in that study. And then if it works out, we have reached level of uh, evidence one. And then we are going, of course, uh, through all this in order to uh, get it commercialized. But we don't know yet where we are. So this was um, my presentation. So I hope it gave you a little bit insight into uh, the possibilities, but also the potential pitfalls and the problems. And uh, just say, I think we have done all the mistakes you can do. But we have learned from it, I think. So at least, it's, from my point of view, it's getting better and better. Uh, but uh, being a project leader on some of this, it is that every morning you wake up, you have to ask yourself, what can I do for the project today to get it that further on? Because it's huge and it's close to drug development to do biomarker development. Okay? <laughs>